Good morning. It's an immense pleasure to introduce quickly who they are. I know you have all their uh, a bit detailed um, CVs in your booklet, but as I know each one, I will mention how we met, so we have a, you have a little bit uh, a, a more personal relationship uh, idea of uh, the, the round. So, um, Anne Meester, uh, you might know, she's the designated new director of the Kunsthaus Zürich. Um, I met uh, Anne at the Franz Hals Museum in Harlem. Uh, I think it was in 2015 when she organized a symposium called uh, the Transhistoric Museum, which was then uh, went into a, uh, the making of a book. And um, yeah, so you will probably talk a bit uh, also about this issue, the Transhistoric Museum. Then we have uh, Laurent Lebon. He is uh, since last summer, I think, the new president du Centre Pompidou in Paris. Before he was the director of the Picasso Museum in Paris and we happened to somehow work together in a wonderful, uh, really ambitious, big, uh, incredible project you um, initiated, which was called Picasso et la Méditerranée and included 70 different museums around the Mediterranean. That was uh, about five years ago. And then uh, <laughs> there is uh, Chris Dercon. He is the president of the RMN, the Réunion des Musées Nationaux et du Grand Palais des Champs-Élysées. I met Chris, I think, in 19... 86. Yes, we worked on Bruce Nauman together. In Basel, there was a big show of uh, Bruce Nauman, and he came with a TV team to make an interview with uh, Bruce Nauman from Brussels to Basel. These were the good old days where mass media were still interest, genuinely interested in artistic production. So, um, now to do an interview with Bruce Nauman for TV would be totally unacceptable. <laughs> Not for him, but for TV. Uh, uh, do we have uh, other microphones? Or yeah, it works. You have a, oh, yeah, you yeah. Have yeah, a, yeah, we have okay. a Madonna headset. Okay, it's but we published the interview in Parquet, yes. and you kept me hostage for two weeks uh, in uh, the house of Jacqueline Burkhardt because you wanted me to finish the interview. <laughs> And I couldn't finish it because I didn't understand what Bruce was saying. <laughs> but it happened to be a great interview and I still consider it as my pension because it got published in 10 languages. So I still owe you some money for Parquet. Wow. <laughs> it could have saved Parquet. It right, right. would have uh, participated yeah. in the <laughs> revenues. <laughs> okay. So let's start with a discussion. Um, the theme is of course, matter of memory, but it's also the museum of the future. And be before we talk about the future, I would like to look at the now, huh? uh, at issues that seem urgent and uh, eternal at the same time, because we talk about <laughs> museums. So, um, Talking about memory and matter, the museum is a device that combines the two, matter and memory, uh, in a very sophisticated and uh, efficient way. The museum is a so-called battery, like uh, if you want to think about uh, Joseph Beuys. The house and the object in it uh, store memory, but this memory has every day to be kissed awake again and again. So. Um, would you like to say something on this very general issue? Should the, the lady <laughs> kick off or the gentleman? You're in the majority, so you can choose. <laughs> yeah. You are Kunsthaus Zurich. Uh, not, not yet, Chris. I am still the director okay. of the Franz Hals Museum. 
which is important to point that out. I'm the incoming director, so I'm about the future. But I, I, I think it's, when we discussed the topic of the, the talk at Wilder Museum of the Future, we're way too old to talk about that. I mean, I'm 46, I don't know exactly how old Laurent and Chris are. We're not the future, we're more like, we're the now and the past. But asking about the now, it, it's a very, I mean, two notions have been triggering me in the past months, together with my team at the Frans Hals Museum. And one was the notion of the critical museum, we are currently working on a publication called uh, The Anatomy of the Museum, edited by our curator of contemporary art, Melanie Bühler, who is Swiss, by the way, dealing with this dilemma of like how uh, museums dealing with the desire to be more inclusive, the, the demands that are being put on, on us to, be, to, to, really strive to really strive towards social equity, to deal with decolonization, to deal with uh, fair practice issues, and how museums are often torn between the theory of that and the practice of really implementing it. How do you make sure that you do not only talk about those issues and produce discourse, but that you change the structures behind, which is difficult and slow and uh, meets with a lot of opposition and it's like a deep time process while the discourse goes very fast. Um, and this book, which I could not bring yet because it's not finished, um, one of the things when reading through the text, I was very struck by a, a panel conversation and specifically by what one of the participating artists, um, uh, Grace Nidiritu, said. She, she mentioned that in her practice she constantly thinks about deep time and that she feels very connected. Everything she does is connected in a way to cave paintings of 50,000 years ago, so very transhistorical but also that this means that for her that the museum should really be a holistic place that on the one hand that it really reflects everyday reality and the political and social discussions we have but at the same time also continuously remains aware of the fact that it deals with history as a process that the past is not something that we classify it's ongoing um, and that it also means that museums have to be aware of the fact that what we actually do is not storing and activating objects, but thinking of the legacy of those objects. And that's physical, but also uh, it's a, a lot of it, what, what do they mean today? How can we use them today to talk about bigger issues? So that's, I mean, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think we have all these social political issues that we want to deal with. We want to do it critically as a museum that also deals with contemporary art. But the reality is that we're caught in a web of dependencies that sometimes goes against critical thinking. And that means that we just have to be operational. So I think that's for me, that's one of the big dilemmas of museums today. How do you deal with criticality? How do you incorporate also forms of institutional critique that artists are producing today? And how do you do that genuinely with the awareness that museums are slow? They don't change fast. They change at a sort of dinosaur pace. So that's one, and it's, there's another notion, but I'll talk too much, which is more the notion of empathy, but I can come back to that later, the empathic museum. So a museum normally has a collection. Now uh, the Centre Pompidou, as we know, is going to close for four years, I think. And what happens to the, uh, this idea of kissing the objects uh, awake every, every day? Oh, we are going to send them to the Kunsthaus Zurich, all of them, voilà, when we are going to close. Voilà. Is that an uh, offer? Voilà. <laughs> but you, they don't need us, because as you know, when I was thinking about the introductions, and sorry, I apologize, because my English is very poor, that's why I was uh, elected for president of the Saint Pompidou. You know, in French, you, you put at the presidency, normally not male, not white male, not white male all, but uh, normally people who don't speak English. Voilà, so that's the main quality. And, and, we, are, and, voilà. and we are all presidents voilà, in France. Voilà. Everybody's a voilà, president. Voilà. And so I am in between queens and a king. So <laughs> like, like, like in Gartenzwerk, I was thinking, how can I begin uh, to think about uh, your wonderful question? And I was thinking, because I like a little bit the Dada spirit, uh, and I said, well, why not doing a kind, it's, it's completely improvisé, as we say in French, but I said, I, f I was thinking of you, Bitche, you know, and I was thinking about the four letters, and I said, B, B, like Bachelor, 
Uh, voilà. Because we are uh, here thanks to you, uh, thanks to, to your invitation, thank you so much. And uh, I was thinking about the idea to have public and private together. And thanks to the bachelor, we are in this wonderful room together. And I think in France at the moment, but elsewhere in the world, public and private are much better. Now, if I, if I come back to the public institution and to Picasso, the first Picasso was acquired in a national institution in 1933. So 52 years after the birth of Picasso. And it was a gift. Why I am telling that? Because I think, thanks to the Bachelor and other private eyes, we always, always need a private eye. We always need an individuality. You know, it's always the story when you ask a commission to draw a horse, it becomes a camel. Uh, and uh, in our country, we are like that. So I think uh, it's very important to come back uh, to people who have the leadership. And then, of course, I will be would be for beauty. Uh, because I think we lose a little bit the spirit of beauty, and I think we have to come back to that. I, of course, for integrity, uh, for intensity. And when you, speak, when you think a little bit about the Saint Pompidou, you know we, we have in the same box a library, the most important one in France, and a museum, an important collection. And people don't go to the museum and the library. They go to the library, they are young, and they go to the museum, they are old. Uh, they go to the, uh, to the library, they are with not so much money, and they go to the museum, they are quite wealthy. And so that's the main challenge. Uh, for C, of course, perhaps I will be rude again, I was thinking about censorship. And uh, I think the main challenge for us today is to avoid self-censorship. And I think we have a big question about that at the moment in our country, in our institution. And then with the E, it's very easy, of course, energy, enthusiasm, but I will say engaging spirit. Uh, because now we have a problem of scale. We have a problem of atmosphere, and I think uh, a gathering, uh, an initiative like that, it's very specific of what we need. I think we don't need bigger institutions. We don't need square meters and square meters. What you know everyone, and we have another king, which is always writing, on Solrich, uh, but uh, you know, when you read the, the philosophy of Hans Solrich, always thinking about the archipelago, about the constellation, but we have to come back to the quality. And what we see after the pandemic, fingers crossed, that people really, really want more quality, more hospitality, and especially in our institution. And I think the Engadin spirit, with a little idea close to the Saint Pompidou, in the same place, uh, you have uh, uh, ice where you can do sport, you have uh, uh, a good restaurant, you have art, you can rest, you have the landscape, you have the beauty, and this collage over Dada concept, I think is very important, and we have much to learn from the Engadin spirit. Thank you for this uh, brilliant panorama of uh, really important... It was completely improvised <laughs> with my poor English, <laughs> but... Uh, and, and, and it's all about you, Bichel. Well, voilà, voilà. <laughs> but when I, am, when I am between C for curator and the king, so that's it. Voilà. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we have fun, and uh, I know... <laughs> Chris, um, yes, you have a Grand Palais, it couldn't be bigger, but you don't have a collection yourself, but you are a bit king of other museums which have collections. But, but when, when I hear both of my colleagues, I think, you know, the expectations of museums today and tomorrow, they are so huge that I wonder why do these two brilliant young art historians still want to do that job. <laughs> because the expectations are enormous on museums. I mean, and especially during the pandemic, and I published this in an article for um, the book of Christina Bechtler and Dora Imhoff, the expectations are indeed increasing. I mean, during the pandemic, everything was questioned. 
I mean, the structure of governance, the structure of sponsorship, restitution, uh, neutrality politics, uh, the whole idea of post-colonialism, equality, social systems. I mean, it was a mountain of demands, which of course, where we could trace back to symposia, we have been talking about these things, nobody, nobody ever took us seriously. We were allowed to talk about it in symposia, uh, but when we wanted to change something in museums, it was quite difficult. So the demands are huge, the list is ever growing longer, and I wonder what that means for the future. And indeed, the question is, who still wants to do that job? That's number one. But back to matter and memory. I think we should replace the word memory with the word remembrance. Because if you talk about transhistorical, I don't think that the word memory in the sense of matter memory of Bergson still fit. I would like to go back as far as Benjamin, thinking about latency theory of Anselm Haverkamp, that we can work with these collections and we should work with them in a different way when we consider them as forms of remembrance. And forms of remembrance is also talking about incompleteness. Because, of course, it's ridiculous to say that Rembrandt equals Rineke Dijkstra, right? It's, of course, also ridiculous to say that um, a Delacroix reminds us of a Kehinde Wiley. I mean, it's ridiculous. But if we consider these as incomplete, then suddenly we can start working with them. And that's the great thing, and that's why I'm jealous of these two uh, brilliant colleagues. That is the great thing about collections today. The possibilities are endless, and especially in a time. In a time which is defined by the thickness, the thickness of the present. We live in a synchro time, and the thickness of the present, I mean, I would consider the whole hysteria, think of Rotterdam with the Open Depot, the NFT, immersive exhibitions. I mean, there are many, many examples of the thickness of the present and this whole synchro time. I mean, the fact that in popular media that we keep talking, like in the films of Christopher Nolan, of these endless loops where we can only jump off The thickness of the present is dreadening, and that means that we have really to think very carefully what we are going to do now with these collections. But there is a way out, and there is a way out when you consider them as incomplete, as infinitely, that you consider them like Anselm Haverkamp is saying, as figura cryptica, where we can get back all the time messages, and that's exactly what you're doing in Arle, and that's exactly what the last 10 pages of your book are about, besides the local and the global. So I think there is, when we now start to forget the dimensionness, when we start to forget matter and memory and think about incompleteness, then we have a kind of amazing freedom. But today, what's it at stake are these collections. And I'm a little bit surprised that Laurent seems to announce that the way out is working ever closely together with the private. Does that mean that the Centre Pompidou is going to be together with Arnaud and Pinot? I mean, just thinking about it. Uh, so, it, it, there is a lot to do, but we should not give in to these demands, because otherwise we are overloaded with work. And the demands are big, and they are often asked by politicians, by collectors, by artists, but also by people surrounding us, who don't have a clue what our work is about. I think, Chris, I agree with you to a certain degree. I think you need to be a sadomasochist to do our job and love, love the Sisyphean task of constantly walking up the mountain and rolling back. But I think, apart from demands, there are also really desires that we have ourselves to change. You know, like, uh, that, I mean, one of the things that I've been struggling with also in the Netherlands is like, people don't like complexity anymore. Uh, people like simplicity, but art works and art objects and art ideas are complex. And I would like to defend that idea of complexity, that's a desire to do so. It's also an impossible task. And on the other hand, I also would like the museum to be more a sort of an empathic museum. Can that you give listens. an example of complexity? Well, 
if you look at, in, uh, for example, when we were working in the Frans Hals Museum with these notions of combining the past and the present, uh, one of the discussions would always be like, yeah, it has to be visually alike. You know, we want a Kehinde Wiley next to a Frans Hals because they do look alike. You, know, you can see the connection. And we said, well, no, let's talk about the underlying concepts. I want to show a... Uh, Let's, uh, I want to show uh, a work of Patricia Kaarsenhout, a Surinamese Dutch artist that talks about celebrating women of color next to the militia pieces of Frans Hals. And people were like, yeah, but that has nothing to do with each other. So well, in the, the concept is exactly the same. It's celebrating power through a table. But so every time when, or at least I hope Switzerland is different, in the Netherlands, when you try to approach things on a more conceptual narrative level, it's over. It needs to be visually alike. And I think as museums we deal with images, but we have to show that these images are so layered. And exactly as you said, they're always unfinished. It's not that they're, they're not done. You need to rethink them and redo them all the time. But that's a genuine desire I have as a museum director. That's not a demand from the outside. Uh, but there will come a time when we have to give up these classical divisions between the 19th century museum, like the Musée d'Orsay, or the Louvre, or the Centre Pompidou. I think what is exciting for you guys is to say, I want to change my institution within, without all these demands, but maybe I have to do it bigger, like a bulldozer, and saying, I'm going to show in the Centre Pompidou the Louvre, and the Louvre is going to show pieces by the Centre Pompidou. Maybe that's a way to start there. I call it the cleaning job. You know, it's like Kerchner, it's like cleaning. Well, um, the very uh, good topics you you uh, touched, well, we will talk about it later, but I mean, the museum is a paradoxical place, and uh, you have uh, Laurent Lebon, who did a brilliant Dada exhibition in uh, 2001. Five. Five? 2005, uh, at the Centre Pompidou. It was so perfect, complex, poetic, everything you wanted that it would stay there forever, but, but of course it's, it's a contradiction against the spirit of Dada, which is ephemeral, and uh, so this is the paradox of, uh, of our work, and um, I love it. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing wrong about this paradox. It's even, uh, it's even the big quality of the, of the, the museum, museum in, in the context, in the texture of uh, what we do every day and how we think and what, imp what kind of impulses come, suddenly there is this place which is different. There is a difference. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, this paradoxical place and um, I have here some names. We have to store things but, and we have to make them accessible because they have fallen out of time. So they come back into time and they f have a, f a, a potential to, to have a positive, a productive friction also with the rest, which is still fallen out of the time. So but that's the reason why I think we should start to consider, and I come back to the incompleteness and the infinity, we should, to, we should start to consider the museum not as a concept of space, because we see many expansions. And I don't think expansions are the solution. By the way, in Switzerland, you have now two disappointing expansions. I don't call names. But we have to consider, we have to consider the museum as an architecture of time. I mean, if we can consider the museum as an architecture of time, we don't need to think about expansion, we don't need to think about this and this and this. We, we, we have to deal with it in a completely different way. And that's where, of course, the work with the collection comes in. And that's not even a paradox. It's, it's a very, very normal way to go, especially because today we consider these works as unfinished. Yes, I mean, the, the, the museum is also a place where the intimate and the public uh, meet. And I think this um, is that we also, it's a place that uh, is about shared subjectivity. So it's, 
it's if you say it's not finished, it's uh, our collectively shared subjectivity is uh, we share everyday experiences, uh, which I think um, is interesting now that museums address more in the titles of the museum, of the exhibitions, this uh, shared ex uh, uh, experience, everyday experience, then having a title, the post-war um, uh, uh, reception of uh, the surrealism, uh, for instance, which would be a strictly art historical uh, reference in the title. So I think the museums address this uh, collective subjectivity. Do you th think, see this also have a, as a potential to, to develop in the, in the future with these burning uh, issues we, we get, uh, you know, just reading the newspapers? Yes, I do, but I see another paradox, which is, because I, I agree with Chris, and maybe they don't, I don't see the paradox as a problem. As you said, it's exciting to work in such a schizophrenic situation. But I think there's also another paradox that as a museum, we want to be this place of gathering, but at the same time, we're still very sanitized spaces. You know? Like, we don't have shops in the museum, we don't, have, we don't eat food uh, within the museum. We're sanitized and still a bit sacrosanct, even if you don't want it. And we aim at, I think, this morning at breakfast with Hans Ulrich and David Baumann, we were talking about the fact that there's a deep desire in the museum that we want to slow down time. We want people to make, give attention to artworks, to so maybe do that quietly, maybe do that precisely. But life out there goes at a very, very fast pace. And we were discussing the Serpentine Gallery in Fortnite. We said, where consumption, if you look at that generation also of my children, they consume images very fast with very short attention span. And the museum, in a way, goes against that. So if we want to tap into new generations, we'll have to deal with do those two levels of speed. The fact that in museums, we still want slow thinking, slow watching, but the way people deal with images outside of the museum is fast, rapid. It's rapid consumption. It's short attention spans. It's kicks. And I try not to be, um, how do you say that, have a moral judgment, but those are two different realities of dealing with images. And that's something, I, apart from dealing with political and social issues, it's also how we deal with images has developed. And how, how will we handle that as a museum? Yes, but I think um, it, uh, that um, capability to, to uh, read images in a faster pace like montage uh, in the film. So you, 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 uh, that was something I was obsessed with, this idea to, to then use it for, for how to juxtapose art from different times mm. with this principle we know from, from our perception of the films because uh, first of all it's 24 images per second and then uh, you, you can switch from uh, the narrative back and forth and, uh, and uh, have a, a fast pace and, and slow down. So I think this can be a principle also in, of the museum. It's not either or. Yeah. You can play with it and play with the new capabi capability of perception. We are not 19th century persons anymore, but the museum structure is still, aimed at still that. Uh, yeah. stuck in that, in that uh, principle. Yeah, and we still expect people to be quite passive spectators. And I, I think we don't really know as museums, we talk about active spectatorship, but we don't really know how to do it. We don't know how to put people in a mode that they really move freely and think freely in the museum. I mean, we had it last being in a gym, uh, last week in the Netherlands, we still had all museums in lockdown since Christmas. And after two years of being marginalized, the cultural sector really had enough and decided to have a playful protest. So museums were turned into gyms. So we had Trojan workouts amongst the old masters. Which Sounds actually, very Dutch. Yes, actually it was, actually it was great. I, I, I mean, it was a great way to activize, activize the mind and the body. But 
suddenly everybody, one, on the other hand, said it was Dutch, it's playful, shocking, but also thought, why not? Why do we not find other modes of interacting with art? Why do we always still see it as retinal, intellectual? Why can't we find other ways so that people really engage in a different way? But by the way, uh, Anne is not Dutch, she's Belgian. Very important okay. for and me we, and Chris. We invented surrealism, <laughs> so I just want to make sure that... You know. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I know I will, that would be my big struggle not to be Dutch. Do you want to add? Uh, no, we are still uh -huh. very classic, by the way. Uh, what, what strikes me always, and I will not take Swiss comparison, but for example, if you take the Saint Pompidou, two floors, 15,000 square meters, 80% of paintings, no moving images. You think that the 20th century was not dealing with images, with films, with, so I think we have many, many things to do, and to come back to the collection, uh, it's like an iceberg. Uh, you have one person, two person, three person, which are on public display. So the question from Chris is the question of the ICOM, you know? Do we need a new definition for the museum? When you take the French law, first article, to have a national or a French museum, you have to have a collection. But now, what is a collection which, which you can display only one person? Well, it's uh, because it's public money. So all the, the, the debate about conservation, storage areas. So I think it's very, very interesting. But for, for, this, for this, I think we are still very classic. And what strikes me when you say about Louis Vuitton, Pinot Collection, and even the extension you, you quote, I think they are all very interesting. I will not be so negative, but they are very classic in the spirit, finally. Uh, and when that's, that's I think it's, a, and of course we are optimistic, we've done get in spirit, but we have to be careful because we can die. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it could come uh, faster uh, than, voilà, you, of course, the museum and libraries are not creation of the 19th century, but they were put very high on the 19th century. So one, one century after, it's still a question, and I'm, I'm optimistic, but it will be very, very difficult, because it's always, you know, when you have big institutions, like the Kunsthaus, like the Grand Palais, you say, we have this sentence in French, les arbres qui cachent la forêt, the trees who, which are hiding the forest. And, all the museum, when you go in France, you have nobody. They are empty. I think what Laurent is saying is quite important because, I mean, uh, there are colleagues of Anne and uh, uh, Laurent who are sitting on museums with vast collections. I think about MoMA, I think about the Metropolitan Museum. And I remember that Max Hollein once said to me, I would like to do an exercise before we start to think really through the expansion, I would like my curators to think we are not going to collect anything for three to four to five years. What then? Glenn Lowry, on the other hand, is, has been saying, which is quite interesting, maybe we should rethink the vastness of our collections and the balance between the work we do with exhibitions coming from the outside and exhibitions from the collections. Because we all know that curators, they, they are not ducks sitting on their collections. That's over. Because this new generation, the new generation like Laurent and uh, like Anne, and I can say this because I'm an older person, I mean, this new generation coming from biennials, coming from uh, manifestas, coming through the channels of Europe, they think about exhibitions, they think about collections, this, they think about the museums quite, quite differently. And when I say we need to invent the karger to clear up the museums whereby we can, you know, move one to the other, not in terms of what is mine and what is yours, but in terms of this whole idea of shaping time and architecture of time, then we have to think also about the new balance between collections and exhibitions. And I wonder what these two people are going to do about that, but I'm sure that their colleagues, I mean, I'm speaking a lot of younger people in museums, and they seem to be, they seem to be, is that me? No. Yes, they seem to be readily agreeing that, that um, the time of 
going to I'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to sh is this here? The time is the time of I'm going to shop and buy and buy and buy for the collection. I think that might be well over. And of course we have a responsibility towards the galleries, we have a responsibility to the artist. And I, I wonder what what can be done there because it's it's of course quite 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 normal that galleries and artists they want not only to be in private collections they want also to be in public collections but i wonder how we can find this balance just just to give an example uh, to go in the way of chris last week we have the acquisition committee of the saint pompidou as everyone knows we are one of the poorest institutions in the world with a very very small budget we bought 1,000 work in one committee. So you can open a museum after one acquisition committee. All right, so it's, we have to think about that. It's like a, something never-ending story. And I say, like Max, to, my, to the team, we have to stop a little bit because it's, it's, too, it's easy to buy. It's much more complex uh, to match the offer and the demand. You know, one thing which is now very, very relevant in our country and I think it's the same in your country, the same in Europe, you have this huge increase of the offer. More and more museum. But the demand is not going so good. So it's like, well, you have two, but it's the same people who are going uh, one, two, three, four times. But we don't reach the public which is completely uh, disconnected with the world of museum. When you ask but 50... Sorry, Laurent. No, oh, I don't please. want to interrupt. That's important. No, no, but yeah. just to give you the, the, the official survey in France, when you ask 50 years ago, 100 people in France, how uh, much do you go to a museum once a year? 30%. 50 years after we did the survey last week, the same 30%. No increase in 50 years, but 1,200 museums in France. Do we know how that is in Switzerland? Because in the Netherlands, it's quite the opposite. The Netherlands has enormous pre-COVID, enormous museum attendance. 30 million visits what you want in one if year. You, if you organize gyms in museums. Then. Well, that was during COVID. Yeah. Hmm? A gym can only have 10 people. A, 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 a beach you, do we know how museum visits percentage-wise are in, in Switzerland? I, do I people... Don't. I don't know the numbers. To some that would be my first task to investigate. But um, <laughs> can I just... Can I, can I say something yeah. to, towards what yeah. you and, and Laurent were saying? Because I think there's a third way. I mean, you can not buy and you can amass objects. But something I am very interested in, and I don't know if it's, it's applicable to a bigger museum like the Kunsthaus, but what we did with mid-scale museums in the Netherlands was saying, okay, our role in the spectrum is not to buy finished objects. Like, we don't have the money for that. It's too expensive what we don't want to buy, and it's too, uh, too static. What we do is we invest in artistic production. We choose certain artistic positions. We talk to artists what they want to produce and how can we co-produce that process or that object. And in the end, the object comes into the collection or not, but the focus is on investing in the artist and in the process, and also doing that collectively. We said, often we're competing as museums to buy work from the same artist. Why? Why don't we co-acquire a piece so that it gets a bigger platform and that it doesn't sit in storage for the upcoming 10 we'll years. Welcome. Yeah. We, no, but we, I'm, we I'm did, curious how, this is of course mid-scale, oh. mid-scale museums. I don't know if you can extrapolate that to we, bigger institutions, but we need also to play a, lo a role in the artistic production process and not just look at the finished product. We will be completely with you. We did that with the Tate and, and, and so I think it's a really a tendency which should yeah. increase. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Enabling a production of pieces which can also be ephemeral or stay in the collection. Or one has to be creative now. I think um, in, the, in the Fondation Van Gogh, we don't own a Van Gogh, and we have shown a lot of Van Goghs. We have done a lot of exhibitions where there is maybe only a one tiny one, even only a letter, or but. There is just the spirit there, and you, whatever you show under the frame of or, or under that uh, lettering, you have 
a relation, you create a relation and you don't need a collection and uh, you can, you have to, mm -hmm. to invent uh, new, uh, new presentations. But styles. I think, I think yeah. listening to Iskand Adams and to Pamela Rosenkrantz, I mean the practices of these two artists and also Armin Linke, which we heard here, I mean, we, we, we cannot say we don't buy you. Uh, you are too complex, you are too this, you are too that. And that's the reason why I want to buy a little painting, you know. No, these people are making these things today. They are makers. And what was striking for me in the, our Matter and Memory Conference, which I would like to call Matter and Remembering Conference, is that these artists are working with, indeed, an architecture of time. They are working very much with time-based pieces, weaving the weft and the warp in terms of textiles, the whole idea of archiving and photography, this endless loop which we are seeing and reordering and structuring them, and the way Pamela Rosenkrantz injects her work in exterior and interior spaces. I mean, this is demanding that we have to change the role of what we are going and how we are going to acquire that stuff. I mean, it, it's like when, when, when you hear these three people speaking, I'm sorry, but they are more precise than most of the curators I, I hear. But do you think, Chris Bickers, do we need to own those works or do we need to make them possible and make sure that they get distributed? That's your but question. But was also saying like, yeah. Like she manages the artistic legacy of, of Van Gogh without managing the material legacy. So I think that's a really big question. Do we, yeah, we should show we also Van change Gogh our notion also. of we show yeah. of course, but we but you don't own them. it. We lend like them. A, and so uh, also, yeah. yeah. So as museums, do we need to own in a traditional way or can we own in a new way? Laurent. I say it in a new way, of course. <laughs> You have to watch out because both of you, I mean, what you're saying, everybody's like, you know, <laughs> tweeting this. I mean, I'm the maester. I, I know I should normally, I should just shut up because... <laughs> uh, I, I think we should uh, really talk about the public uh, briefly before we <laughs> end the talk. Um, big topic, inclusiveness. We know we have to be more inclusive. It's not new. I think... Uh, I belong to the generation we were talking about democratization of the museum, um, inviting people, uh, in German we said, against the Schwellenangst, so uh, make it more friendly, inviting, etc. But uh, the problem now is we have, how can we be inclusive in a in a not stupid populist way and not and also escape the terror of clicks and uh, rankings and all that they all Doron looks at me and Chris you wanna I think I think inclusiveness is in the doing like, uh, and it's really not about counting numbers or political demands, but it's also a, a, an immense task. I can only talk about the past. Also, in the Frans Hals Museum, we realized we really want to be inclusive. There was no demand from the city. The city doesn't give us anything, and they don't demand anything. But then how to go about it? And we also realized that this is, this is a gargantuan task that everybody is doing at the same time, separately. So we founded an association with the Van Abbe Museum, and the Centraal Museum in Utrecht saying like, okay, we are mostly white, monogamous, not so male anymore. How can we be more a panorama of the actual citizens of the Netherlands? What do we need to do that? And we th we th our only solution was to do it collectively, because if we would do it individually as a museum, we would just reinvent the wheel. And we also decided that we have to start not with programming, but start at the back si backside. Talk about how do we behave toward each other? How do we hire people? How do we pay attention to language without becoming afraid? Because what I see happening in the Netherlands is people are compulsively politically correct and it's very superficial. Just, I'm sorry that I talk about the Netherlands so much, it's my point of reference, but when I arrived at the Frans Hals Museum in 2014, 
we wanted to discuss the notion of colonial history. And then people said, ah, of course, you come from contemporary art. That's a special preoccupation. You're Belgian. That's interesting for you. But it has nothing to do with us. You know, like, been there, done that. And slavery and the whole colonial legacy was a non-topic. Now, eight years later, it's the hot topic. Everybody addresses it, but it's become compulsive. It's like, we have to do it, but nobody really goes deep and says like, okay, if we talk, if we make exhibitions about the topic, how should it actually change us? But is, is it, am I talking rubbish or is it kind no, of... No, 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 <laughs> I, I'm just um, thinking that with the digitalization, we know that uh, there is a, a, a broader discourse which can also be or should be also very local about what's happening in the art scene, in the galleries, in the institution showing art, is, is uh, disappearing, is shrinking. The, the photons are shrinking, the art critics, especially in smaller countries, in smaller places. It still exists in, in places like Paris, London, New York, you have uh, uh, good art critics, uh, there are debates, there are exchanges, but um, in, uh, there is a, a disastrous um, um, development, I think, um, with, with, uh, with the smaller countries, with the uh, regional places where, um, you know, the globalization becomes uh, more inclusive, but at the same time, it's neutralizing and it's up in the air. It doesn't uh, refer to a place anymore. Um, yes, is the museum becoming a, like a tax-free shop, something which is exchangeable all over? The I, I don't share your pessimism, and because I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to be able to work now in France, and when you think about the regional museums in France, I mean, their collections and their activities, the whole idea of the frac. I'm, I'm totally with you. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, because otherwise I you have to leave. I think it's an underestimated treasure we have in the regional museums, right. but it's not in the public eye. It's not in the public I, knowledge. I, I mean, I, every time, oh. you know, I call the south of France where you are working the Silicon Valley of culture. And whenever the exhibition in Toulon uh, of uh, Picasso Mediterranean, the exhibition of uh, the design of the Centre Pompidou, and Laurent is doing with Picasso already, and now again with the Centre Pompidou going out. These things are picked up by the media, and these things are picked up by the public. We In just France, have to make sure that we do it. Unfortunately, it's not happening. Huh? This it's is not happening here. France, also uh, Jack Lang and uh, what? Because France is a very centralized country, there is also a, a movement still. Uh, mm. which I don't share. I don't share your pessimism because I can exactly say the same about Great Britain. I mean, the exhibitions in Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, when I was director of Tate Modern, we, we all ought to see them, and we got to see them. I mean, the whole expansion, so to speak, of Tate Liverpool was a very good example of that, and the same. I'm sorry, Bitch, the same is true in Germany. No, I, ca I, I, share, I share, but you were talking about England, where the, there are still uh, the, a lot of medias, uh, uh, paper medias, uh, all fighting uh, different opinions, which is healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, France also, you still have. And look at Italy, even under Berlusconi, it was a, a rich uh, cultural uh, media um, landscape, fantastic for culture. And uh, I must say, in Switzerland, it's uh, the desert. Mm -hmm. There are, it's a contradiction. You have, uh, as we, ha you, we are here, we have fantastic galleries, we have fantastic institutions. Uh, people come f uh, to Basel Art Fair. Art Fair is expanding to Paris. Uh, well, maybe, yeah, yeah. We are players, we are international players, but in the country there is no, no exchange about really a bit deeper ideas, what artists want, what they do, what it's I the, said it's with the Bruce It's the first Alman, time you know? that I hear you so pessimistic. 
I'm totally pessimistic when we talk about uh, exchange of ideas. That's where I come from. I, mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. when, uh, very young. I was a critic at the Tagesanzeiger. But what's, what's, what's happening here, what's happening at the Museum Sush, uh, you know, what's happening in, in, in several smaller places, I, I think it's terribly exciting. We were, last night, Laurent, we were saying we are so happy to, to be here, to, you know, to learn about these but things. But I, I, that's what I say. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. amazing things happening, but there is no public exchange about the ideas behind it. It's just um, gossipy or, um, or it doesn't exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the medias. Mm -hmm. Are you pessimistic, uh, Laurent? Well, I will come back just only to something very important in, in our country, is the schools. Always, we try to, to say that the operas, the museum, the libraries are the ones uh, which are going to transform all the system, but I think mainly it, it, it begins at schools. And, and uh, we are always, we have, Many relationships around Paris with uh, with uh, college and lycée. You go 20 minutes outside Paris by metro, and I attend the class. And I say, well, are you go going to come to the Saint Pompidou? No, I don't go to the Saint Pico to the Saint Pico Pompidou because it's in Paris. You have this this frontier. You have this limit, and the task is huge. I'm not pessimistic, uh, but I think we should come back to very pragmatic things, of course, inclusiveness uh, and very philosophical questions are completely in our DNA. I remember, and I will have a, a souvenir for him, Richard Rogers, the definition for, for, for the Saint Pompidou of Richard is a place for people 50 years ago. That was his definition, I think still completely alive today. But if I come back to very pragmatic thing, for a school, a classroom, 20 minutes for Paris, what is the problem is how to come to the Saint Pompidou. It's basically, they don't have the money uh, to get the transportation system. To, it's so easy, it's a very small things, but I think it's, a, it's beginning at that moment, because if you don't have a first shock when you are six or seven years old, it will be difficult after to come back and trying to convince. So, so I think we have a huge uh, responsibility, I mean Versailles, Le Louvre, Orsay, Le Saint Pompidou, because uh, if the first visit is a nightmare, and we have all in mind, especially in our country, when you go to the Louvre, to the Egyptian department, you make two hours to go to the Egyptian department, you spend one hour with 100 people around you, and you understand nothing, and you come back and you say, I hate the museum, and it's finished. Fortnite forever. <laughs> voilà, so, voilà, that's, so, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's paradoxically enough why decentralization is important. We just did with the Louvre 18 exhibitions in 18 cities in France at the same time about Islamic heritage because these local cities and centers were from very early on so important for these exchanges and it brings me back, you know, this, this, this idealistic, maybe naive, uh, but almost utopian ideas that we, we should, we can decentralize. I mean, discussion in uh, Bayern, uh, the, the rich collections of the Pinacoteca, I think it would be wonderful to go out to Passau and to Augsburg and, and to other places. So decentralization, paradoxically, paradoxically, Laurent is, is probably also a way uh, to create this flu, or is because you're a specialist in decentralization. If you say that. <laughs> and do you think that also remedies what Bichi was saying, that in the, or what I understood that you were saying, that in the mainstream media, there is no real discussion about art. The mainstream media, whether it's France or Switzerland or Germany or the Netherlands, reports on money, on scandal, on uh, provocation. There is no in-depth conversation about art. Really? And I've been wondering, well, I, d I don't really read it, but maybe I'm a, a wrong... I, maybe maybe I'm the a public wrong. is uh, <laughs> responding on that. Uh, do we have another? I would like to ask a question about the development of collections in the museums. We had, maybe starting in the 80s, we had always these complaints, all the collections 
are starting to be the same. You have the, the, the 30 best artists in the United States and in Europe, and you find always the same artists in all the museums. And now we have the dictate of inclusion. And I want to ask you, are we now replicating the same pattern? We have to have a Latin American, and we have to have two African, and one Indonesian, and one Indian. Are we going to replicate the same pattern now? Can I answer to that, Thomas? Can I respond to that immediately? I think what, I, what we saw happening in terms of African-American art, in terms of Tiesta Gates, in terms of uh, David Hammonds, in terms of Carrie James Marshall, it's something we can learn from. It's, 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 I don't call it inclusion. I, I think it's incredibly important. That's just an example, painting. When I started to work in the 80s and especially in the 90s with Latin American artists like Helio Di Sica and other artists, I think it was absolutely important to look at these things because they learn us something. Something which is that the trans historical is something we needed to open up the world and to let these works come into our collection. I don't call it hysteria, I don't call it a dictatorship. It's something we forgot to look at when I look at the oeuvres of certain women artists in Colombia, like Helena Rupstein, for instance. These are things which we should know, we should know about. So this opening up is absolutely essential because museums are about producing culture. And we have a responsibility towards the production of culture. So, no, it's no dictatorship. We have to be open, we have to be very curious. And at the same time, of course, we have to bear with judgment. Because one of the things I cannot bear with coming from the theater and working in cinema is how lack of critical judgment in the so-called visual art world is existing. We have to learn to say, this is important, this is not important. This is a contribution, this is not a contribution. This is necessary, not necessary. In the art world, we don't have critical judgment, barely nothing anymore. And that's something first we have to learn, really. Um. Doesn't? Yes, thank you very much for such a wonderful and important conversation. My question would be, is there a future for museum without solid building, maybe like a floating geographical structure, and perhaps that would be the way to expose collections to more like wider audiences. Would Centre Pompidou uh, be up for it? And what are the obstacles developing this idea of floating museum? Thank you. It was cool. uh, you, you mean uh, the incarnation in an identity of a geographical moment? Uh, uh, no, uh, exposure of collection uh, in different places, not necessarily I, museums, we, all we, over we, the world, uh, and perhaps even without one building. You, you know, that's, 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 uh, it could be... Uh, thank you for your question, as we say in French. Merci pour votre question. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very complex one. We did a one hour uh, of a discussion, but as you know, in uh, the Centre Pompidou, we have the Centre Pompidou in Metz, east of Paris, in Malaga, in Spain, in Shanghai, in China, and now in Brussels and in Jersey City. If nobody knows where Jersey City is, it's 15 minutes from Manhattan, uh, on the way from Newark Airport to, to Manhattan. Voilà. And so it makes the, the situation of the identity of the Centre Pompidou very complex because the real name of the Centre Pompidou is Centre National d'Art et de Culture and the musée is Museum National d'Art Moderne. And so you mean, uh, especially at the moment in France with the political moment, uh, the meaning of national is something quite complex to, uh, to, to make a definition. But to come back to your question, I think if people come to the Saint Pompidou, and even in Malaga, in China, and they see the same thing than in Zurich, in New York, and in London, it's a disaster. It's a nightmare. I think they want to see something very, very specific. And, but our role, I think, of course, is to display this collection for everyone. That will be my definition of national. Nothing about identity, but a collection for everyone, a collection for 
people from Angadin and from Shanghai. And it's very difficult, of course. My colleague of the MoMA, Glenn Laurie, always say, ah, Laurent, uh, I don't always understand why you have so many branches. I think we are stronger when you are concentrating in one building. And I think it's one of the key questions of the moment. And at the moment, I think we are coming back more to a concentration in one place, but to have this idea that the collection could be everywhere. And especially when we are going to close, we will be in this spirit. Thank you very much. Um, there are many hands here. Um, okay, in the very back, um, you get the microphone. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the panel for the really great discussion today. And I really like the point about getting young people into museums. And I'm curious to know if your institutions are uh, working to advocate for more funding for schools to support things like visits. In the UK, they actually cut the art uh, exams that students would take. There have been massive cuts in this area. Um, but it plays a big role in business, fashion, architecture. Uh, so what are your institutions doing on that front? And then the second point is there was a, uh, I think it was a gentleman from the Pompidou. Um, uh, you know, I spent time as a patron for children in the arts working with lower income children. And it is difficult for them to get to a museum, even if it seems very close for us because the families do not have the money to be able to go to these uh, types of institutions. So what is being done also to help support families who live in regional areas to go to the regional museums uh, you know, when, when it might be closer for them or easier for them to uh, go to. Thank you. Uh, of course, we, we're trying to, to get some funding. But in France, as you know, one thing which is very interesting is that everything is free uh, for people under 26, uh, even temporary exhibition. Uh, and so what we can see, unfortunately, is that of course, it's a, something quite general, but there is not a direct relationship between the price, because it's free, and the demand. You, you can be free, and you don't have many people more. So we have to be much more precise, and we have to go to the schools to, to even bring them to the museum. But if you do it with force, I think it will not be a good thing. So it should be st still a pleasure. So one thing, for example, we are trying to do, we have one day, w which is the closing time, Tuesday. And we said, why not transforming this day for a specific day for children? Because this day, there will be like guest of the museum. And one thing we try to do is trying to make a mix between the younger people, let's say six, seven, eight, they spend one year uh, to learn how to speak about one work of art, and they make the visit. But not for everyone, for very specific people. The one which are the elder one, which are in a, uh, what we call in France, EHPAD, they can't move again. So they, we bring them again to the museum. They are 90, they are 80 years old. And we have this fantastic relationship between someone who is seven years old and someone who is 90, the first visit and perhaps the last visit of the museum. So it's very symbolic. We don't make publicity about that. But I think this kind of moment is like a, an étincelle, a sparkle. And I think it's, it's something which is very useful for today. But it's like a, a daily uh, uh, combat, struggle. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the mountain, and even in Angadin, is still very high to climb. I think it's physical accessibility, like you said. Like we also we provide free bus transport for schools in the suburbs who can't support uh, doing that. But also our type of programming. It's something I, we wonder about. Like our programming is geared towards a certain generation and a certain type of people. So in the Frans Hals Museum, we fundraise with private money to have Inspire Fellows, who are the target group between 15 and 18, and they devise an own program. What they think their peers would find interesting and what somebody like me of 46 cannot imagine. So we also, we decide that we need to ta make new programs made by youngsters in order to be not only physically accessible, but attractive. We just have to pay attention that we don't, that we don't, that we don't, that we keep looking very carefully of what we do. And I give you two examples. 
Uh, the example is, of course, of video gaming and uh, the example of the experience of Hans Ulrich Obrist with the Serpentine Gallery with cows was typical that the older press, I mean, the so-called mainstream critics, that they defied the work of cows and that there was an incredible attendance of youngsters. That's a good example. Second example is, of course, what I call the Emily in Paris example, which is the uh, success of digital, so-called digital immersive exhibitions in Paris. And Laurent and I, we have been exchanging about this because we are part of these tests. We just did in Lille an exhibition called Experience Goya, which is by the smart press, which still exists, is compared to the exhibition in Basel, in Bayerle. Um, and the, the reason I'm saying this is that we can invent new methods, we can invent new ways to approach these people and to attract these people, and they respond massively. But how do we then create a bridge to get them into a slow exhibition, to get them into, yes, even the library of the Centre Pompidou? Because we have seen that in France, as Laurent said, the uh, attendance is still at 30%, but what's more dangerous that of the attendance, the interesting culture, 30%, more and more are moving to the digital. So we are losing them, actually, in absolute figures. So we have to think about a way how to captivate these audiences. We went by the millions on uh, the cows, uh, video games and whatever, who were going by the thousands into the digital exhibitions, because there is the example of Montreal or Quebec, where two Picasso exhibitions were mounted at the same time. One was immersive and digital, and the other one was with the so-called real stuff. Nobody went to see the real stuff after they went to see the digital exhibition, which was kind of interesting. I'm not saying it's bad, because we are testing, doing tests with the Louvre again ourselves. And, but we have to make sure, I mean, that we, that we bridge the gap and that we invent in between the slow stuff, which you are talking about, and between the fast stuff, the massive stuff, the critical mass, that we invent something. And I don't know really what it is, and I hope that Anne in Zurich and Laurent in the Centre Pompidou will show us the way. You put pressure on us. Maybe we just have to wait. Museums are kind of anachronistic, and in the end people like to look at dinosaurs, so maybe we just have to wait until we get that status. <laughs> Um, I know that we There was have somebody to in the front who had a question for a long time. Yeah. Oh, Grace. <laughs> so, in China, where there's no past of the museum, only now in the future, I wonder your observation of the current rapid growth of the museum in China. Second is how they're going to shape the future of the museum. For example, for me to open in Shanghai, take more than as well. Are you speaking about China? Yeah, I'm speaking oh. about your preservation okay. of what's going on. No, I wanted to know where is that? Because the China. China. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's the, 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 what I know of sitting on the board of PSA in Shanghai is that the attendance of younger generations in China is massive. And, and I think some museums in China, and I'm calling a public museum, which was for me one of the excellent museums, is exactly working on all kinds of levels in order to keep them coming. And that's the most important, I think, in China, is to keep them coming and to listen to them what they would like to see in terms of a museum environment, because there is so much at stake. And that's the reason why I asked these cynical questions. Where is that China? You know, because it's, it's a perfectly happy country, isn't it? And it's perfectly isolated right now. I mean, uh, I just wrote an essay for a catalogue in, in, in China where the response was of somebody, uh, we sorry we cannot publish this because you wrote an unhappy essay. So. <laughs> but at the same time, Chris, I mean, we could, we could learn, we, we are, I think, and it's, uh, we are the, the old European model of museums, and I don't think we can change that. But we can learn from other models, and just thinking of, uh, M plus in Hong Kong, not China, but where the Museum of Fine Arts no longer exists as a museum of visual culture. And maybe that's something we can really think about more deeply. We still, even museums like the Centre Pompidou, who have, des you know, ha or go from design to fine arts, we still think categorically about fine arts as an isolated realm. And maybe we have to really rethink the realm of visual culture and be more daring and embracing in, yeah, 
opening that up. Opening up and being aware of the traps, also the technocratic traps and the pop cultural traps, probably. Okay, I think uh, this was a wonderful round and thank you very much. We continue with our program. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.